Please help me in giving him a warm Georgia Tech welcome to our guest speaker, Mr. David Langstaff. Good afternoon. Let me turn this on. Well, it's great to be here. It's great to be here this week <laughs> and not, not last week. And you all have been through a bit, and I, I actually escaped from Washington with the uh, we had snow, I think, uh, two nights ago and then last weekend as well. So I'm not sure Washington is any better prepared than Atlanta for the kind of snow we're having this winter. But thank you, Ritesh, for the introduction. Um, and thank you, Terry and, and Bob, for inviting me to, to uh, Georgia Tech. I've never been here before. I look forward to spending a few minutes with you. So you can see the topic, uh, ethical capitalism, who cares or who should care? And let me start this way. Why do you want to go into business? Why do you want to be a capitalist? So you can read on the internet dozens of articles and pronouncements on unethical capitalism. Further, there are surveys done year after year on the views of the public toward the business executive. And last I checked, we are at, at or near the bottom on the trust scale, less than 10%. That's lower than used car salesmen and politicians. So why do you want to go into business? Now, there are some clear positives. In fact, capitalism is the most remarkable system mankind has come up with for creating wealth, increasing productivity, and raising both the standards of living and quality of life for millions, if not billions, of people around the world. If individual freedom is your thing, capitalism is for you as it is a system that encourages and rewards the development of new ideas, capabilities, technologies, and offerings, as well as innovative new business models. In fact, you can look at entrepreneurship as the art of turning problems into opportunities and ultimately solutions. Yet the challenges we face today, not just in Georgia and not just in the United States, but around the world, are raising serious questions about capitalism. While the quality of life for many is raised, the pressures and impact felt at the bottom of the pyramid is dehumanizing. The extremes of economic and social inequality are widening, and hope for the have-lesses, as well as the have-nots, is being squeezed out. There are real questions about whether our society, or any society, can continue to prosper with such inequities and perceived unfairness. If these attributes are hardwired to capitalism, then what does it say about capitalism? Now, these and related factors force us to confront the question of the ethics of capitalism. Is it unethical? And in the end, who should care? This is the topic I want to probe with you this afternoon, and my hope is that I can uh, share my comments and then we can engage in, in some Q&A for as long as you're willing to continue. So let me start by just touching the age-old question of what do we mean by ethics? And there are hundreds, if not thousands, of books on the topic. It's been discussed and debated for at least 2,500 years. And one way to look at it is to consider the idea of ethics from two perspectives, what we accomplish and what we do. So first, what we accomplish. <clears throat> there are many brilliant thinkers who define ethics around what is accomplished. People like David Hume and John Stuart Mill are two. They represent more of a utilitarian school of thought on ethics, where the ethical judgment is derived by considering the consequences of actions. Personally, I struggle with this approach, as it seems to me to be the first step on what can be an extremely slippery slope, where you can argue that the ends justify the means. And just because a desired outcome is achieved, why is that ethical? Yet we live with the philosophy every day. Think of the coach of the volleyball team who challenges her players to do whatever it takes to win. In business, the goal is often as simple as just making money. And the assumption is that anything goes, as long as, as, long as it is not illegal, or for some, as long as they're not caught. And yet, the pursuit of self-interest has led to huge systemic failures that have hurt millions of people. 
If you adhere to this approach to ethics, it begs the question, who sets the goals, the desired ends? And it is one thing to make money for yourself or for your shareholders, but then who's responsible for preserving a system that is fair and avoiding the assumption of irresponsible systemic risk? We saw this problem in the financial meltdown of the last decade. We also saw it 250 years ago in the overgrazing of public lands in England that became known as the, as the tragedy of the commons. In both cases, disaster resulted from the pursuit of individual self-interest because no one felt a responsibility for the system. So this approach to ethics totally depends on the morality of the desired outcome. Is it fair? And for whom? And if we accept, the go that, if we accept that the goals are just, then we can begin to understand Gandhi's comment that there's no difference between means and ends. This idea is embedded in the idea of teleological ethics, which states that the means are the ends in the process of becoming. The means are the ends in the process of becoming. It can be a bit circular, but also can be helpful, a helpful way of thinking in that it forces us to see the connection between means and ends. To look at ends and means as the extension or precursor of the other. So I'll come back to this point shortly as it offers a way to think about the role we need capitalism to play in our society. But for now, it opens the door to consider the second approach I outlined, and that of considering uh, ethics from the perspective of our actions or what we do. So this approach by, of considering ethics by what we do rather than what is accomplished is most closely associated with Aristotle and his notion of virtue. Aristotle was very clear on what constituted a virtue and defined it as the mean between two extremes, each of which would be considered a vice. An example is courage, which taken to one extreme can be cowardice and to the other recklessness. Another is compassion, which to one extreme can be obsequious fawning and to the other a cruel cold-heartedness. And this approach originated not only with the Greeks, but also can be seen in China at about the same time in the thinking of Confucius. It was later embraced in the 13th century by Thomas Aquinas and became a key part of middle-aged Christian orthodoxy. And today you may recognize it as the root of the golden rule, which is so prevalent in many cultures and societies around the world. And in the US today, I think this emphasis on actions rather than accomplishments, tends to form the basis of our ethical framework. Now, living a life of virtue, acting in, in accordance with a clear sense of what is right and wrong, is, the core, uh, is, is at the core of the idea of character. But to be blunt, thinking or knowing without action is not enough. There's absolutely no ethical grounding unless one follows thought with action. So I would go so far as to argue that knowing what is right or wrong and not acting in accordance with that knowledge is the ultimate character flaw. Confucius, Confucius said it best, <clears throat> to know what is right and to fail to do it is the worst form of cowardice. Yet we see this situation in business all the time. And you, as young people launching into your business careers or engineering, you will face this dilemma repeatedly of being asked to do something that you feel is wrong, yet worry that if you don't do it, your career prospects will be jeopardized. Because of the reality of this kind of situation, I urge you to look at the work of Dr. Mary Gentili, who has focused on how to give voice to values in the business environment. Finding your voice sounds easy, but amidst the pressures of going along, it can be immensely difficult. So Aristotle, I believe, recognized this fundamental frailty of what it means to be human by arguing that people need to habituate virtues. Through repetition, one could make virtuous living a habit and minimize one's susceptibility to temptation. And today we might call this the development or the strengthening of conscience. Now, with this conceptual framework of ethics as a backdrop, how do we then consider the ethics of capitalism? 
So let me state up front where I come down on this issue. My bottom line is that capitalism is neither ethical nor unethical. It is absolutely neutral. It's like baseball or eating. And both can be performed in unethical ways, but that does not make the game or dinner unethical. It is the people who practice it who can act either morally or immorally. And to blame the system is to avoid looking at ourselves in the mirror. Now to state the obvious, capitalism delivers the most value to all of us when it is, pra when it is practiced ethically. When was the last time you went into a restaurant and had to prepay for your meal? How often are you billed for services already rendered or for a product that's already been delivered? Trust is a foundation we must preserve in our capitalist system. Yet, it is easily eroded if we find that we don't trust the actors. Trust is essential. And today, trust in capitalism is being challenged, I think, in three areas that we must address. First is the appropriateness of the benefits that accrue to the top. And executive compensation is an obvious example. Second is the plight of those being left behind. And third, the broader question of sustainability, whether we are so caught up in our own near-term self-interest that no one sees it as their responsibility to protect and preserve the system. And what links these three concerns together is a moral one, and it's the question of fairness. So just look at what we've seen in the United States and around the world these last few years. Switzerland proposed curbs on executive pay, and the European Union took up caps on bonuses. In the United States, we saw Occupy Wall Street movements and long unemployment lines across the country. And then with the last economic recovery, Statistics showed that the top 1% received more than 100% of the economic gains. Now, what do these factors reflect about our society today? And if you are unemployed or not part of the top 1%, how do you feel about it? So there are some who argue that by getting out of the way and letting business pursue the profit motive with minimal interference, <laughs> and most certainly minimal government regulation, is the best way forward. <clears throat> this thinking has been the doctrine of such people as Milton Friedman, and for many years, and, and for many has its root in the 18th century writings of Adam Smith, in his inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. It was Smith who famously noted that man, and I quote, intends only his own gain, and he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was not part of his intention. Smith showed how the division of labor at the pin factory would lead to stunning increases in economic productivity. This thinking took the name of laissez-faire capitalism, which argues for minimal government involvement because an unintended byproduct of the pursuit of individual self-interest would be a greater improvement of society than if the government had actively directed it. Yet even Adam Smith didn't fully buy it. And in The Wealth of Nations, the part people don't read, <clears throat> Smith went on and reflected on the unintended consequences of the division of labor. And he noted, the man whose life is spent in performing a few simple operations becomes as stupid and ignorant as it is possible for a human creature to become. The uniformity of his stationary life naturally corrupts the courage of his mind. Smith goes on to say, but in every improved and civilized society, this is the state into which the laboring poor, that is, the great body of the people, must necessarily fall unless government takes some pains to prevent it. So this is Adam Smith, not Karl Marx. And even Adam Smith recognized the amorality, the amorality, not immorality, amorality of capitalism and the critical need of society through government to set rules and minimum standards. So I find it highly ironic that Smith today is considered the champion of those who argue for minimal or no government interference in business. People actually ought to read all of Adam Smith before they cite him as their intellectual godfather. 
The problem with this thinking is that the goal being sought is one measured only in terms of economic productivity. But is this the kind of society in which we want to live? And where is the morality of this approach? So my point is this. If we are to live in a democracy where individual citizens collectively will determine the kind of society in which we are to live, then one cannot ignore the impact on individuals, all individuals, of what is clearly a highly efficient and productive economic system. If we're not committed to democracy and find another form of totalitarian government desirable, then the impact of, of the economic system on the individual may not be of concern. In this case, people may simply be viewed as economic inputs. But we have chosen to be a democratic society. So a problem we face today is that the two major engines of our society, capitalism and democracy, are not in sync. What we have, what we have not adequately done is fully consider the link of a neutral system, capitalism, on the people it touches and the consequent impact it has on the basic values of democracy. Now let me offer a new way to think about these challenges. <clears throat> One that views capitalism not as a standalone and separate system, but as a fully integrated part of the fabric of our democratic society. It's rather simple and combines the, the ethical focus on both ends and means. In this approach, we don't start with capitalism or look at the economic system, which would be the means, but instead we begin with a more fundamental examination of the kind of society in which we want to live, the ends. I fully expect that we would all agree on the desirability of economic growth, productivity, and a high quality of life for as many people as possible. But what else? What non-economic values and characteristics are important to us that we are willing to take steps to nurture, protect, and preserve them? The way we answer this question provides us with the moral foundation of our society. So with this initial understanding, we can then ask the question as to what kind of economic system will get us there. What are the means that, in turn, are the ends in the process of becoming? What are its characteristics? We can then focus on the more difficult topic of what is different in our envisioned society from the present. And how do we get there from here? It is in this context that we can best consider what we should be able to expect from business. So what should we do? Let me suggest five topics that, by addressing, will help move us to achieve the necessary realignment of business with the longer-term needs and goals of society. First, we've got to move away from the notion of shareholder primacy. Today, corporate purpose has been hijacked by the notion of shareholder primacy, that the purpose of the corporation is to maximize profit for its shareholders. This view was never the intent of corporate law, which granted certain protections in recognition that a corporation would contribute for the betterment of society, not just its shareholders. And it is not corporate law today. We need to recognize that a corporation has an obligation to many constituents, first and foremost its customers. Without customers, you don't exist. In fact, the economic investor, the shareholder, really stands last after the company has addressed the needs of customers, employees, and in many cases, its communities. Second, we've got to confront the disease of short-termism. In recent years, the pressures on corporations to deliver as much as possible now has intensified. And no CFO or CEO of a public company wants to explain why they miss their earnings projections and then see their stock collapse. The problem is that we have become caught up in what Roger Martin, the retired dean of the Rothman School of Business at the University of Toronto, what Roger calls the expectations game. The need to meet investors' expectations at just about any cost. And this pressure leads to a short-term focus and short-term decision-making where, where quarterly performance is more important than the long-term health of the company. Now, an interesting point to note is that 
in my view, addressing what I call this disease of short-termism actually helps address the conflict and tension between a shareholder and a multi-stakeholder view of the corporation. If companies were to take a longer view, the interests of the shareholder and other stakeholders begin to align. A key condition for this alignment, though, is that a company define its financial objective as building sustainable long-term value rather than maximizing short-term profit. Now, third, I think we've got to rethink cost accounting definitions and performance metrics. Our current accounting system was developed at the time of the Industrial Revolution, over 200 years ago. It was established for companies that manufacture products, and it has not kept up with the, key with the way business has evolved. It is, focus is a, it is a forced fit for service companies and simply cannot adapt effectively for knowledge-based businesses. It makes absolutely no sense for the acquisition of a services company to be largely recorded as goodwill simply because our system doesn't have asset categories that apply. Furthermore, our current accounting methodologies ignore costs that society can no longer ignore, such as pollution, other environmental damage, and other downstream effects. And as a result, the definition of profit is fundamentally flawed. If we stay with our current cost recognition system, and if you assume that you get what you measure, it should be no surprise that companies don't address costs and issues that, by their metrics, simply don't exist. And we need to rethink what we call costs and ensure that we are accounting for the true impact of business. Fourth, <clears throat> we should establish long-term investment incentives. We can't expect business to suddenly take a long view. The market pressures are too intense. Yes, we'll see examples, and we do see examples of enlightened leadership, but we need it to be in everyone's interest to take a longer view. So if the market forces of capitalism are a river, we are foolish to try to stop it. However, we can redirect it. And one straightforward change that I support is to redesign capital gains taxes, for example, and make it markedly more progressive, meaning a very high tax if an investment is held and liquidated in a short period of time, declining to zero if an investment is held for five or seven years or more. With this kind of incentive, the market will see it in its own economic interest to become more of a long-term investor. And finally, fifth, I think we've got to revisit the role, the responsibilities, and the operating model of boards of directors. And I leave this point to the end because I think it, it's maybe the most important. And it's certainly the area where, where immediate traction can occur. And many boards have fallen into the trap of believing that their primary role is one of ensuring compliance. This, was, this saw even greater emphasis after the passage of Sarbanes-Oxley legislation a decade or so ago. But this role, while necessary, is insufficient. And board needs to be, boards need to be spending more time looking forward, not backward. The role of the board is to ensure that purpose, vision, and core values of a company are in place, to engage around matters of strategy and direction, and then to give the CEO and the executive team the time and space to engage in responsible, balanced decision making. By understanding the nuances of, a co of company strategy and how it must play out over time, boards are better able to establish the appropriate performance metrics that will indicate, indicate both progress and success, and thereby hold the, they're able to hold the CEO accountable for performance. But in performing this role, Boards are, more, boards are more able to help CEOs counter the short-term pressures, pressures of the market and to ensure that companies do not make short-term accommodating decisions that are not in its long-term interest as responsible contributors to society. If this work cannot be done at one or two day-long quarterly board meetings, then companies should consider changing the board operating model to enable it to properly perform its job. <clears throat> what right do we have <clears throat> to deplete critical natural resources for today's consumption 
and ignore what will be available to and needed by future generations. Tell me why short-term profit that drives this kind of behavior is good for society. What right do we have to process raw materials and create products in such a way as to cause irreparable harm to the environment, contribute to global climate change, and potentially cause ir irreversible and negative impact on the health of the earth for all future generations? Tell me what kind of cost accounting methodologies that allow us to ignore these costs are good for society. And what right do managers, not founders or creators, but managers have to profit at the level of tens and hundreds of millions of dollars for simply managing, and at times failing to manage well, it doesn't matter which, an enterprise the responsibility for which they are entrusted. Tell me why such extreme allocations of benefits are in the face of poverty and inequality are good for society. The new construct that I propose allows us to take into consideration such moral issues as we think about the kind of society we want to have, the kind of economic system that can get us there, and the kind of behavior, metrics, and leadership we need from our business leaders as the key drivers of the system. My point is this. Capitalism as practiced in the United States today is unsustainable. It is destroying other important values of society. It is ignoring the realities and trade-offs of the global community in which we live and with which we must coexist. It is time that we, as a society, explicitly consider the values we treasure that we will put off limits, off limits to market forces. This point was best stated by Arthur Oaken, <coughs> the economic advisor, advisor to President Johnson, in his 1975 book, Equality and Efficiency, The Big Trade-Off, he noted, society needs to keep the market in its place. And given the chance, it would sweep away all other values and establish a vending machine society. Now, I believe that unless we address these issues, capitalism as practiced today runs a risk of falling under its own weight. A system that is seen to be unfair where the people in control are seen to benefit at the expense of increasingly large number, numbers of people being left behind, will rapidly lose its legitimacy. The public will not accept what business so conveniently calls unintended consequences. Legislators will be pressured to pass laws, and businesses will find the playing field for business to be further and further constrained. Already we are seeing it happen. Twice in the last 15 years, when we witnessed major corporate failures of responsibility, we got added regulation. We saw it with Sarbanes-Oxley following the fall of Enron, Arthur Anderson, and MCI WorldCom. And we saw it with Dodd-Frank following the financial meltdown of a few years ago. Society simply will not stand by and allow companies to continue to prof profit for themselves in the short term when the costs are so damaging to society in the long term. So it seemed clear to me that it is in the best interest of business, and therefore business leaders, to exercise a more responsible, longer-term leadership and be seen to be doing something about it. It's what Alexis de Tocqueville called self-interest rightly understood. The wrong thing to do is to ignore the issue, use our corporate lobbying strength to push off any kind of undesired legislation, and only fall into line when new laws on the books force us to do so. This kind of approach is not the leadership we need from the business community. As Leo Strine, at the time he was Vice Chancellor of the Delaware Courts, and today, as of three weeks ago, he's now Chief Justice of the Delaware Supreme Court, commented, referring, referencing the tragedy of the commons, we don't have time to relearn the lessons of the 18th century. So what's interesting to see is that other notable organizations are reaching the same conclusion. The Aspen Institute Business and Society Program, the advisory board of which I chair, has been addressing the problem of short-termism. The Committee for Economic Development, of which I'm a trustee, has just launched an initiative on sustainable capitalism. Just the fact they have to use the adjective suggests that capitalism is not sustainable. 
The World Economic Forum at Davos just a few weeks ago had a panel on ethical capitalism. The Brookings Institution has been re-examining the topic of corporate purpose. And the Center for High Ambition Leadership in Massachusetts is working with CEOs and boards in examining the role, responsibilities, and focus of boards of directors. Further, we're seeing increasing examples of far-sighted leadership at US businesses. Take a look at the values and the more than two decade performance of Henry Schein. Take a look at Becton Dickinson. Recent studies completed by Harvard Business School and Babson College confirm that companies that take a more socially responsible long view outperform their peers. My own experience in building Viridian is that having such clear values attracts talent, which in turn can provide a competitive advantage. So if you believe, as I do, <clears throat> that capitalism, the system, is by definition neutral, then you must return to the human actor, to each of us, to you. <clears throat> each of us must start with our own personal values. If you don't know what you stand for, you have no basis for ethical decision making. None of us have the luxury of just living our life without thinking, and the need to really think to set priorities, to know what to fight for, and know when to walk away. This will kick in at different times for each of us, but at some point it does kick in. I urge you not to allow yourself to just go along. Allow yourself to be outraged. Allow yourself to be passionate. Above, above all, believe in something and set moral standards for not only your own behavior, but for the community in which you want to live and the society which you want to leave to your children. So I have four children, two of whom are ice hockey players. Wayne Gretzky is arguably the greatest hockey player of all times. He gave interesting advice to young hockey players, which was to play other sports and do other things that develop different facets of coordination and skill. His point was that it takes more than just hockey skills to be a great hockey player. The same can be said about business. Don't just study and practice business. Read a novel. Embrace the humanities. I have to tell you that in my experience as a CEO, when I have needed an accountant, there have been many to choose from. When I needed an engineer, there have been many to choose from. But when I'm looking to promote someone to the executive ranks, I look for something else. Not technical expertise, but judgment, critical thinking, emotional intelligence, compassion, the ability to connect with employees, values that I trust, essentially skills of leadership. So embrace the humanities, listen to music, do the kinds of non-business things that put you in the shoes of other human beings. It will sharpen your own thinking about your values. It will make you a better person and ultimately a better leader. So above all, my advice to you is don't accept the status quo. Get involved. Create networks of similar thinking students and young professionals at other business schools. And push back on your professors who teach you that discounted cash flow analysis is the right or only way to perform investment analysis. We need to challenge these holy grail concepts. I and mean, you are the leaders that matter, as you've got far more runway than I. So in closing, to the question of ethical capitalism, who should care? We all need to care. More is at stake than capitalism itself. It's too easy to blame the system. And I urge you to see it as a problem that you can do something about. Any morality in our society, including in our economic system, must come from the standards and behavior of us human beings. And here, knowing what is right and wrong is simply not enough. As the German philosopher Goethe stated, knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. So make it personal, because in the end, it is. What kind of society do you want to leave your children? Let's answer that question and then unleash the extraordinary power of, new, of a new capitalism that balances society's short and longer term interests 
that measures and accounts for the real cost of its activities and which is fundamentally fair and doesn't inappropriately profit the few at the expense of the many. In the end, we all must care. We need to look to ourselves and expect a more responsible leadership from, its, from, from business practitioners. If we want to live in an ethical and moral society, those values and practices must come from us, whether we're businessmen, politicians, athletes, students, engineers, or simply as citizens. And for me, values-based leadership is the only form of sustainable leadership. And I think ethics-based capitalism is the only form of sustainable capitalism. So thank you. <clears throat> <clears throat> So I'm happy to take questions if, if uh, you have any. Yeah. Uh, David, thanks for coming to Georgia Tech today. Uh, I guess one question I would have that regards uh, your thinking regarding managerial accounting or cost accounting and the fact that businesses tend to privatize profits but socialize costs. I think that's what you're referring to. Uh, are you uh, sort of suggesting that things like carbon taxes should become reality to force business to recognize the, uh, the impact they're having on the environment? Well, whether, whether carbon taxes is the answer, something has got to be able to account for the costs that business imposes on the environment. So that's one that has gotten traction around the world. So, you know, it may not be perfect. Uh, we, should we should at least enter the, engage in the discussion and see what else there might be. But something like that needs to be part of the equation. What other alternative would you imagine something like a carbon tax? <clears throat> you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an accountant, so I'm not sure I, I mean, some of these may, may be out there. But I mean, depletion of natural re, other natural resources, um, um, we should look at how that's accounted for. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure what other, what other methodologies, but I, but I don't feel we've had that discussion amongst people who are other than on the fringe. Now, carbon taxes, I think, come, has, has made its way into the mainstream. But, but for the most part, um, we haven't had that discussion. Yeah. David, I've got a question. Yeah. Thank you, for the, Mr. Lane staff, for your, speech, uh, your talk today. I just want to ask you a question. Can you talk a little bit more about like the, like the work that your company did, like I don't know if it's consulting services, like with the D Department of Defense, like what kind of work that you did with them. So I, you know, it's funny. I'm a history major, and somehow I end up running technology companies. Um, but uh, Task and Viridian as well was involved, um, and, and Viridian was sold, and so it's now part of General Dynamics. Task is continues as an independent company, but it, it's doing sort of high-end systems engineering. Uh, for for the intelligence and the defense community. So, you know, when 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 you you know you think about how we uh, the satellite system, for example, that 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 the intelligence community uses, um, someone had to design that. Somebody had to come up with the architecture for that, and and that was done with the government. And then the government turns around and, and contracts to you know the big aerospace primes for or defense primes to build it. But it, it's a really around the design and architecture of complex systems uh, that are involved in either the collection or the processing or the analytics of data, um, developing com you know, secure cloud, cloud computing or uh, cloud architectures, things like that, um, data analytics, uh, the whole cybersecurity field is a big one. So that, that's the kind of work. And then, then, and then, and then just good, good solid engineering of, of some of these systems. Hi, I have a question. Um, what are your thoughts on for benefit firms that are using um, capitalism and the desire for profit as a means to create positive societal uh, impact? You're talking about the B corporations? Yes. Yeah, yeah. the uh, uh, B corps. I mean, so I like, the, I like what motivates it, but here's where I have trouble. It's, and I mean, number one, I don't think it's fully tested. So it's, 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 it's on the books of a lot of states. But I think, I think what will be interesting is to see whether, whether it stands up to hostile takeovers and all that kind of stuff, where, where the whole body of corporate law 
um, ways in. But I think, I think it, it's, it's saying something really important that people want to create these and that they're being very clear about their purpose being more than simply making maximum dollars. Now, where I have trouble with it also is that I don't want, I, I don't want to see the B Corps go that way, which, which then tacitly or effectively allows the C Corps to not. And I think, I, think, I think we should expect the same thing of the C Corporation. So, so you know, I'm all for the, the, the idea, the movement, if you will, but I'm not willing to let the C Corporations off the hook. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Um, my question builds upon a previous answer question you were asked, and my question is: Despite being an uh, under, despite having an undergraduate degree in history, how have you dealt with the challenges of leading a highly techno technological workforce? Well, okay. So, you know, the, the 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 curious thing is that that employees are all human beings; they're people. And I think I think I think whether you're you're an engineer or an accountant or or a marketing executive, I mean, at, at some level, you're motivated by the same sorts of things. So, I, you know, to me, leadership leadership is something which, first of all, has to come from you. I mean, otherwise, it's not authentic. And 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 I th I think that that you can you can lead you can lead people of all sorts of you know training and education, uh, uh, regardless what your what your what your what your own training is. I mean, there you know there are companies that are run by. I think General Dynamics is run by a lawyer. Uh, you know, you've got you've got all sorts of people who 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 end up running companies. So I think being a history major and 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 you know being um, and my early career was in finance. I did investment banking and venture capital work for about four or five years until I realized I was on the wrong side of the table, and I wanted to build companies, not just support them. Um, but you know, it, you know it, we all find our our path, and I, I just don't think that there's any any one recipe or any one path for for leadership. Okay, um, I guess my my question is a little more. I'm, I'm back here. Where are you? I don't see. You. Oh, yeah, okay, very back. Oh, good. My, my question is more on the philosophical side. So, um, you know, the ethical based decision making for forward projections. Um, from a business standpoint, I think a societal standpoint makes the most sense, but it's awfully hard to do that when governance tends to be reactive in how they treat business. So you would have some crisis and then they pass some law. So it almost seems like if you want to create an ethical business structure and ethics as itself evolves based on societal interpretations of things, how do you propose that you do this without some sort of fluid movement of the governance, because you really can't separate government from capitalism. Right. I, I agree capitalism's neutral, but you know, you've seen economists argue that the governance side on a capital society will evolve from democratic to you know, socialism to some sort of communism back to some sort of yeah. you know, other realm. Well, so I mean, a few, few reactions. One is, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a few years before we get the laws you know, that follow events. But, but you know, what we're dealing with right now is not a healthy environment, which is, which is it, we're, we're dealing with an environment where people don't trust business. And therefore, something's going wrong, it's because business did it. And, and, there's, and you know, we've lost having the benefit of the doubt. But I think the ultimate answer to your question is, uh, I mean, I, I'm in Washington, and we've got huge national issues. And you know what? The voice of the business leader is largely absent. And it's because they've got lawyers advising them, keep your head down. If you get out there and you start talking about this stuff, you're going to get shot off. You're going to annoy a shareholder and all that kind of stuff. Well, this is, this is you think that's leadership? So I think, I think the answer to the question has got to be that we need, we need it's two things. One is we, we need a bit more courageous leadership on the part of business executives. And, and I mean, ultimately, the answer is you do it one company at a time. And then secondly, this is why I think boards of directors, um, I mean, I, I, I tend to fault boards of directors almost more than anybody else in sort of the process that we've been through the last 10 years or so. Because, because a board of directors has got to hold the CEO and team accountable. But, but the board of directors, the minute there's a shareholder that's putting pressure on, on the company, the, board, the, the boards are caving. And what we need is for the boards to be so grounded in the company purpose and strategy and understand the stuff that they they are in a position 
to push back on the shareholders. And, and you know, why, why, you know, we haven't even gotten into the discussion of why is it that a, a shareholder who ho holds a stock for 20 years is treated no, no better um, than somebody who bought the stock last Thursday and, and intends to sell it in a month. And that's a whole nother conversation. But the point is, there comes a point where you need to push back on the shareholders. And I think, I mean, this is where I talk about trying to create the, create, create the time and space for a CEO to be able to balance short and long-term decisions. So I think if boards got more involved in this, if business leaders started to be more proactive in, in helping address these issues, you can start to rebuild trust in business. And, and, then, and, and then, you know, at the end of the day, there's still going to be legislation passed or something, but hopefully it's more responsible. I think we've got to regain, we've got to regain being seen as welcome and productive, not simply near-term self-interested parties at the table. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on the role of corporate lobbying, because a lot of the, a lot of the changes that people well, that many people who, as we said, distrust in business, many of those changes that they would like to see sometimes get stopped in the political conversation. Sure. Due to this kind of corporate uh, interference. And I was just wondering if you could Well, uh, on that. yeah, I mean, you know, I think lobbying, lobbying has gotten out of control. Uh, I've had elected officials tell me that our system is one now of, of legalized bribery. Um, you know, this is, this is, these are their words, not my words. But it, we have too much money in politics. I mean, the whole Citizens United case, I think, was, was incredibly irresponsible. And, and, you know, what we've got is this notion that, that business, you know, the big companies, I mean, you know, TAS doesn't have a lobbyist, but, um, but big companies feel that they don't, they play by their own rules and that they can get legislation changed when they need to and things like that. And they, they put incredible amounts of money into this. I think it's out of control and it's not good. Hi. Uh, I really like how you say us as if you're speaking to leaders now, but and I think your prescriptions are really great uh, ground floor, long-term steps for millennials to take as they enter the working world. But they're very long-term acts. And for entry-level workers, it's going to take, at best, a generation to affect this change that you're talking about. So what can these students in this room do to help enact these changes until they become leaders or if they never yeah. become leaders? Well, I, so it's a good question, and, 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 and honestly, I think it may well take, hopefully not a generation, but a lot of years to actually get there. So, I mean, you know, it's a little bit of Gladwell's tipping point. We're nowhere near the tipping point. But, but you'd be surprised. I mean, I, I was surprised, and, you know, at the number of, of organizations out there that are beginning to look at this. Again, not fringe organizations, but pretty serious mainstream organizations. Uh, you know... Harvard Business School had the initiative. I don't, you, you probably know more about this. Um, in fact, it's going well beyond Harvard, which is a, about the business oath. I mean, there's students at different schools that are caring about this. The, the B corporations as a, as a force is another example. So I think it's like a, a garden where you've got a lot of seeds that have been planting, and they're all sort of beginning to show some, show some results here. But, but you know, the, I think you've got, you won't get anywhere unless you start to talk about it. And, and uh, in Bob's class today, we talked a little bit about the process of interviewing. I mean, I, my feeling is that, that you all, you know, you're probably thinking about who's going to hire me, how am I going to get a job, the economy's lousy, uh, and all that. But don't, don't underestimate the fact that companies want good people. And what you can do, th even through the interviewing process, is start to shape the conversation. And you ought to ask them about the company values and where does the company come down on issues of sustainability and how do you balance the long and short term. These are not the kinds of questions that most first interview candidates ask. But why not? You've got the attention through this process of probably more senior people than you will see in the first two or three years of your, of your working career. So, you know, part of, part of my advice is be brave, get out there, 
You may find some think that you're nuts, but I can tell you something. If you go, if you, if you were to take a job at a company like that, you're not going to be the, you're, you're not going to be very happy. You're going to leave eventually, probably sooner than later. So make sure that fit is there. So I think I think it's just you know find find your way to get your voice heard on on whatever issue is important to you, because because it is it is about starting the conversation and 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 getting more people engaged. David, we have one last question. I'm yeah. I'm the last question. Uh -oh. um, it, it's it's an easy one. Uh, you're the protagonist in uh, the Verinian uh, case of putting yeah. value on values. Yeah. Can you uh, summarize for us uh, that situation of the uh, acquisition of uh, Viridian, the, uh, the barriers that you faced in trying to put value on values, and the courage that you, as CEO, that you had to demonstrate yeah. to um, bring a, yeah. a resolution you can live with? So how, how many of you are familiar with the Viridian case, the Harvard Business School case? All right. Um, so I mean, the, the, the short story, I mean, this, you know, I built the company. We grew to a little over a billion dollars. We, we took it public. Uh, and, and my philosophy is largely what you hear here, but it's, it's one of being very clear about corporate values, a commitment to align uh, corporate values with the kind of values that, that that normal human beings want so that you don't when you go to work you don't have to park your personal values at the door and and to really talk about it and act that way <clears throat> and I, I think over time we were known as a company that attracted the absolute best in the field and 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 people would stay with us even when perhaps they had job offers that would pay them twenty or thirty thousand dollars more somewhere else so it was it was a whole philosophy based on the multi constituent not the single shareholder model and, and when you're doing national security work, I guarantee you, you don't want the companies that are doing national security work to be more concerned about their profit than their mission. Um, and, and so that was what Viridian was. And so, and we had a culture that, that built up around that. So when we were, were put in play, the question was, do we sell or do we, do we say no? And at the end of the day, there were four companies that were coming after us price kept going up and it reached a level where whereby it was the highest price based on a multiple of earnings and all that for any for 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 any company in this in this uh, in this space that had ever been offered and so the question then is how does the board turn that down and we ended up selling and i think you know uh, I, and in the way and i don't think this is a cop out here but 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 i i really did have to think hard about about what the right thing to do was, but once you're public, it's not your decision. You know, you're you're now there as a fiduciary, which is why I've gotten interested in what does corporate law really say. Uh, but but the the bigger decision was almost going public, which is could we take the could we take a company that had been built up on this around these values, and could we was there room at the table for the public shareholder which who had a very different set of values. That's one where I you know, took a few walks around the block to really think about, could I continue to run the company as a public company in the way that we'd built it as a private company? And I, and I shared in the class today, you know, part of my answer was, I was going to go on the offense and to, on the roadshow and talking to investors, and, and every, every pitch I gave started with, these are our values, this is our vision, this is, and th this is how I, I run the company. And to lead with that and make sure they understood that, because if they didn't buy into that, I didn't want them as investors. So that that's kind of where to go. But but the, the real issue is that I think intellectually one's got to separate the the ongoing operating entity from those points in time where you have where, where you're making an economic control decision. And so you know in in in, in that sense. I could run the business in a way that was true to the values and such, but then we were forced to kind of deal with this moment in time when it was about who's going to own this company. And, and that, was, that was very hard, but I think from a fiduciary standpoint, we had no choice. Um, and uh, that there's a whole lot of discussion behind that we can get into, but it was hard because the buyer kind of took it apart, and the Viridian that I'd built and that we all felt strong about is... Uh, it's just now sort of who knows where it is. Uh, it's part of general dynamics, but they've reorganized about six times. 
So I'm really not sure where it is. Thanks very much. David, thank you so much.